All right. Well, welcome, everyone. We're really happy to have you uh, here today at the next installment of our general lectures, Uniting Everyone. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about establishing a vi viable business model for your medical device in event invention, reimbursement, and payment tips that pay off. Um, I'm Stacey Heilman, and I am a member of the Dissemination Corps of the ACME POCT grant that I'll be telling you a little bit about in just a moment. Um, before I introduce the speakers, I wanted to um, just tell you a little bit about our sponsors. In addition to the Department of Biomedical Engineering at Emory and Georgia Tech, we also have, as I mentioned, the um, Atlantis Center for Microsystems Engineered Point of Care Technologies. This is a big U54 grant. Um, Wilbur Lamb is the PI, co-PIs uh, Greg Martin and Oliver Brand. Here's on the bottom second point is what the ACME POCT is focused upon. So the GLUE seminar is meant to sort of support and provide information that will help us really understand um, the, the nuances as it relates to development of these technologies. And I did want to just share ever so briefly kind of the ecosystem of the ACME POCT. And this is not what we're here to talk about today, but I think it's really important to highlight this in the context of what the ACME POCT provides. Where we sit right now are in this green area, the dissemination course. So these sessions are all about getting the information out to the inventors and the clinicians about how we can all come together to accomplish our mutual goals. And I also wanted to put in a little plug for this section over here, which is focusing on the projects as well as the project solicitation. So if you haven't already heard, we have our call for proposals that's live right now. And so it's all about developing these microsystems-based point-of-care technologies. The call is prioritizing those projects that could make an impact in rural and or and or low resource settings. So um, you know, anywhere in the United States that's rural or ambulatory care or um, global health. Now, I will say that we're prioritizing that, but it's not limited to that. So if you have a really cool idea that doesn't fit that, that theme, please reach out to us and talk to us about your idea and can let you know if it's, if it's worth putting in a, 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 um, a letter of intent for this first stage. The first stage, the pre-proposal stage is not very hefty. So Friday, March 2nd is the deadline for that. So with that, I'm going to move along and introduce today's expert speakers. We have kind of a, um, an innovative, um, high-tech, I think, in my opinion, approach to this. Uh, here we have an Emory location where we have one of our panelists, Teresa Wilson, and then we have two other panelists who are out in various other locations, and then we have our in-person location at Georgia Tech. We want people to, we've left plenty of time for questions and interaction. So if people in the room at the Emory location or at the Georgia Tech location or via participating via WebEx have questions, I think that if you type them in, is that right, Stephen? Uh, blue you, jeans. Blue jeans. Oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. Blue jeans. So if you type it in, you'll see the question, then you'll give me the high sign. Yes. Or will or will, I think as well. Yep. So please um, do not hesitate to let us know if you have any input or questions. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, today's expert speakers. So first, I'm gonna, going to introduce Teresa Wilson, who is here at the Emory site. <laughs> Teresa is a Medicare specialist who has worked for more than 30 years for the Centers for Medicare and Medicare Services, or CMS, in Atlanta. While she started her career at CMS and is there currently, from 2005 to 2010, she founded a biomedical device company called Celonovo Biosciences, Inc. As with any startup, one person handles multiple jobs. Teresa handled the intellectual property filings with outside counsel, regulatory submissions for CE, MARC, and FDA clearance, marketing, and product development. That's a lot. <laughs> I think this may have overstated what, I mean, I was not a founder. I was one of the four initial employees, but you wear a lot of hats. Uh, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. The company bought, brought two products to market within five years, a microsphere for embolization of tumors and coronary stent. Following passage of the Affordable Care Act, Teresa rejoined CMS to work on the then new model for healthcare delivery, accountable care organizations or ACOs. And I apologize for okay. overstating okay. your contribution, but I am sure it was it was very important and, and vast. So now I'm going to turn to, um, so we're going to start, and Teresa's going to speak, and then we're going to move on to our next panelist, but I'm just going to go ahead for efficiency's sake and introduce our other speakers right now. 
So the second speaker will be Dr. David Kim, and he's representing today's topics from his special vantage point as a clinician, entrepreneur, and venture capitalist. Dr. Kim received his MD from Johns Hopkins and an MBA degree from Stanford. Through his diverse and successful career, Dr. Kim has gained deep experience across the healthcare, technology, and investment fields. First as a clinician at a major HMO network, followed by a successful stint as CEO at a growth stage company. In addition, Dr. Kim has two decades of experience in the investment sector. He has also been a director on a board of, or a board observer of multiple de medical device and biotech companies. Moreover, he is working with multiple academic accelerators and translational medical programs. We're really happy to have you here. I think that a lot of people know that are on the uh, blue jeans as well as at each location are really interested to hear what you have to say from your perspective. Then finally, last but certainly not least, uh, Rosemary Gammon is with us, and we don't have a, a picture of her, is that correct? Um, if, if she wants to okay. show her camera. Rosemary, if you want to share your camera, we'd be delighted to see you, but if you don't, we understand. <laughs> <laughs> so Rosemary has earned the designation of professional for the Academy for Healthcare Management uh, and is the principal consultant at Sage Healthcare Consultants, LLC. She has experience and expertise in healthcare policy, reimbursement, managed care, government plans, contracting, and government affairs. Her clients include, but are not limited to, medical device companies, pharmaceutical companies, investment groups, and startup companies. She has a wealth of experience in reimbursement and coverage strategy and has extensive knowledge of coding, billing, and medical policy development. All a bunch of black boxes to me, so I'm really looking forward to hearing what she has to say about that. Rosemary is knowledgeable about healthcare reimbursement and has worked on both sides of the fence, insurance and service provider side, so she knows the methods and motivations on both sides. So we're really looking forward to hearing uh, everyone's perspective on this important topic. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Teresa Wilson. Thank you so much. I'm so delighted to talk with all of you today. You came out in the rain on a cold day and it's dreary to learn about a an arcane topic. So thank you so much. Stacy asked me to start with the big picture, so that's where I'm going to go. If you want me to do it, I'd be happy to. Um, so this is, I want to give you my contact information. That's my uh, phone number on the last slide, I mean my email, and on the last slide I'm giving you my personal cell phone, which I have given out for 25 years, and it's never over abuse. So if you need to reach out to me, do. So here are the high level concepts that I want to talk about today. Um, and the reason I want to put them out uh, this way is that we, uh, what, uh, what I do best, I think, is to translate one world to another. So in private, in, in Selenova, I translated the science to venture capitalists and, and vice versa. I have to understand what's important in each world. And as inventors, what you really need to understand is the how to get paid for it world. So some of this is going to be, uh, I, I hope, uh, elementary to some of you, but, I, uh, but I'll also give you some high-level overviews of how to get paid for your work and your invention and how to avoid some common pitfalls. So this is the normal sequence of events in getting a medical device paid. You get FDA clearance, or if you're uh, working internationally, you do your CE mark instead. It's faster clearance, cleaner work, and you don't have to uh, have as much uh, clinical work done for CE mark, but you get your regulatory clearance. Then you have to understand how insurance will cover you. And because my background is Medicare, and that's the major driver in the healthcare arena, I'm gonna talk about it from a Medicare perspective. And how you get paid is code by using the appropriate code for your device or service. And then I want to talk about how, how you get paid. You'll notice that coverage and payment are different uh, things to me. And one is you may uh, have a wonderful product, but if it's not uh, eligible for payment, uh, you will never be covered. And I'm going to use an example from Dean Kamen, one of my uh, favorite examples where he created something magnificent and it was not payable. So, um, to get your 510K from the FDA route, you normally do this 
type of sequence of testing, your bench, preclinical, and first in man. For some devices, you may need uh, uh, more human testing, but this is normally the process you take. And look at the key words here. You've got to prove on the bench testing and preclinical that your device is safe. And efficacy means that when you go to the human model, it's going to solve the disease state or condition that you have. Now, it's, in, uh, it's a nuance of policy, but you do not have to, you no longer have to prove your device is better than what exists. The standard for FDA approval is that your device is not inferior to something on the market. It's a very liberal standard, but this is the FDA process. And once you have your 510K, <coughs> you're going to think, I'm ready to be paid, but that's not the case. You have to go to your insurance company. And here are two different words that have legal implication. The service has to be reasonable for this patient and necessary for this patient. So let me explain the concept of uh, reasonable. For a person with a broken ankle who needs a wheelchair to get around, is it reasonable for Medicare to pay for an electronic wheelchair with all the bells and whistles? No. You're going to give them the standard, you know, go to the grocery kind of wheelchair. That's what reasonable means. Is it appropriate for that person's condition? And so for a temporary broken leg, you're going to give them the cheap base model. For a person with compromised lungs and multiple sclerosis, is an electronic wheelchair reasonable? That's what that concept is trying to convey. And necessary conveys, is it essential for this person's illness or injury? So those are the key concepts for insurance and particular Medicare. This is the way the law reads for Medicare. No payment may be made for items or services, and that includes device, that are devices that are not reasonable and necessary for diagnosis or treatment of illness or injury or to improve a function, uh, the functioning of a malformed body member. That's, that last phrase has to do with orthotics and prosthetics, uh, you know, braces, crutches, whatever. And, but you'll notice that there is nothing in that definition that says wellness or health. It's all focused on illness. So I have a lot of inventors come to me and say, oh, if I put this app on a phone, it, it's going to make people healthy. They're going to be informed of their glucose readings 24 hours a day. It's going to make, it's going to save a lot of money. The law does not allow us because it's not, doesn't meet this current definition of reasonable and necessary. And this is a complex legal concept. So if you have a, a, a team member who's an attorney or wants to look into the background of it, I find this New England Journal of Medicine article, even though it's old, to be very good at describing how difficult it is for even us as an agency to interpret congressional intent on what, mean, what it means to be reasonable and necessary. So then I want to talk just a moment at the high level about coding. Can I ask you to show what you know? Do you know HCPCS coding, CPT coding? Is that an alien concept? Okay, when you go to the grocery store and you go to the self-checkout and you scan, you're scanning that universal product code or barcode. So when it comes to a service or a medical service or a widget, like the things that you are inventing, we have a separate coding system called the HICFA Common Procedure Coding System, and we pronounce it in the inelegant way, HICPICS, HICPICS code. And uh, so you're going to have to have a widget. You're going to have to have one or the other for your device. You're going to have to be a scannable code or a HICPICS code or use an existing HICPIX code uh, to, to categorize your device. And why is that important? Because just like going to the grocery, everything we do is electronic. More than 99% of our claims are electronic. So we're not going to look at you and say, what did you do? You, we're going to expect a bunch of ANSI codes in an electronic format. And we're going to use things like diagnosis-related groups for inpatient care. And what that is, uh, that's a hospital care. And it might say, oh, we're doing a cholecystectomy with complications. 
experience. And that's how we might describe why a person goes to the hospital or sepsis or something like that. We're going to have codes for place of service. Did you go to a skilled nursing facility, a doctor's office? Were you in an ambulance? All of those are coded. And then one of the things that's going to be incredibly important to you is to understand diagnosis codes. And we call these ICD-10, or and that's just the version, International Classification of Diseases. But you will submit, or your employer, or whoever you sell your device to, will submit claims to insurance using a coding structure that uh, I think you'll hear more about later on in this uh, presentation. So for me, I want to talk with you about the ones that aren't barcodes. These are the HIC picks codes and there are three levels to it level one is established by the american medical association and it's for anything that a doctor will typically do or a nurse or pa or np so it's services i'm going to visit a psychiatrist i'm going to do an open uh wound repair Level two is where I think you are going to be focused. These are administered by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, where I work, and they're alphanumeric codes, and they describe items like uh, if you see at the bottom that E0290 is a hospital bed, whereas on the bottom line, the 99214, the pure numeric code, is a doctor's office visit of a particular level. Uh, the level three codes aren't really relevant to your work because they're temporary. For example, if there were not already codes for coronavirus, we would need one. You know, we would have to be preparing to get ready to accept claims for coronavirus. So HICPIX is the non-barcode way of describing what your device is. So that E0290 hospital bed is what I want you to focus on. So in your world, barcode or five digit alphanumeric code. The ICDs were uh, developed by the World Health Organization and there are 76,000 of them. And because you're such uh, academics and like to be on the cutting edge, I thought I would share with you. There it is. I love protein structures. It's one of my favorite things in translating science from one group to another. But there is our coronavirus and the code for it. My personal favorite code is ICD-10 W55, where you get down to the discrete level of being bitten by a cow. So ICD-10 can describe every kind of illness or nuance of illness, and that's the way that you will submit a claim to insurance to be sure that it's covered. So ultimately, when I work with the uh, uh, Georgia Tech Biomedical Innovation and Design Group, they are obsessed with, I need a code, I need a code, and, and you need to give me a brand new code for my device because it doesn't exist. And so here is the essential question. Does my device need a new Medicare insurance code, or do I need a barcode like uh, with that catheter, that Zion's catheter, where you, where you, I've uh, highlighted the barcodes? And here is the answer: Who is your customer? Are you going to be selling to a healthcare provider like a hospital? In which case, you're really selling to the hospital CFO or the ambulatory surgical center, or are you selling it to the patient? because insurance only applies to the patient. So if you're selling direct to a healthcare provider, you don't need a device code. So what I will say is you probably need a UPC barcode if you're selling direct to provider or a group purchasing organization. And most hospitals and doctors, frankly, use a group purchasing organization. They will, instead of going, it's like the Costco for doctors. I'll go there and get everything under one roof, and I'll go to my group purchasing organization. They will negotiate prices for me, and I just fill out my order. If you need a code for insurance, you have some widget that is being paid a la carte or in some part of bundle or group, but you're actually billing the patient for your widget. OK. And then I think there are two groups of people that you will uh, need 
along your journey to get paid for Medicare uh, or for any insurance. First of all, for expertise in FDA and filing your 510K, I would strongly recommend that you get someone with a RAPS certification. And that is the professional organization of people who know the ins of and outs of filing all the 510K or the CE mark. And they are certified separately for Europe, Asia, and the United States. And so they're really your, your experts in that. But for insurance, there is no one expert. So you want to look for some of the certifications. And Ms. Gammon is going to probably know better than I how, who are the best of the best in this. But you want a reimbursement expert to facilitate you knowing what code do I really need? Do I need a, a, Hix, a new HixPix code? And if so, I need to do that early because the lead time to get one is generally two years. So those are the experts that I would recommend. And then later, I'm going to talk about some specific case studies uh, to walk you through some of the pitfalls of these concepts. So I'll let you go, Stacy. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question? So, sure. Um, do you, if you need a new code, can you try and get one before the FDA clearance? Because if it's a two-year thing. No, you can't. And part of the process to apply for a code is you have to prove it's not costly to the government to give you a code because a code requires us changing programming across distributed systems. So you have to show that there is a market need for the code. And so, no, you can't apply you for can't it. Can't apply for code. No, but clearance. there are strategies that Stephanie may talk about where you could piggyback on an existing code while you build your new one. And one of my case studies is a Georgia Tech product where we did where they did that. Any other questions before we move to case studies? Oh no no no! We'll go to the other speakers and then back, or I can do you case can studies. Keep going, yeah. Okay. Because well, I think they're going to do it. Do you have a quick question? Uh -huh. Uh, for piggybacking, uh, can price change? Yes. Okay. Yes. So it, let's go to this first example. Um, oh, I'm the one in control yes. here. Before Partha. We, mm -hmm. Real quick before we move on, I just want to remind everyone that this is being recorded and we'll have the slides. So I want to let you all know that. And if you are um, uh, communicate, if you're watching via Blue Jeans, if you can just in the chat put your name and email address, we will greatly appreciate that as well. So we'll go ahead and move to the case studies, and okay. you may start. <laughs> oh, okay. Partha Unava was a biomedical student at Georgia Tech, and he used his engineering skills to say, you know, I broke my ankle, and I've got all these bruises under my arms. There's got to be a better way to create crutches. And so he did, and you can see that in the uh, athletic model, the gentleman is putting the pressure on his forearms and wrists and not so much under his arms. Great invention. He got, he got a lot of publicity, including an award from uh, the president at that time uh, re in recognition of his innovation. The company was called Better Walk and the price, which you can still buy on Amazon today is $100. What does Medicare pay for crutches? I have to tell you, it's under $50. So was his business idea a great one? Absolutely. Was it feasible financially if he couldn't produce it for under that $50? And really, your markup is typically 100%. So he would have had to produce it at $25. That MSRP makes me think his cost is $50. So it wasn't a viable mo model for insurance. But it was a viable market for people who paid were willing to pay out of pocket for the convenience. So what he what he did uh, and so back to your question about piggybacking. Medicare has codes for all kinds of crutches. So what they did was file insurance and get a modest amount from that, but then they had to rely on patients to pay the difference. And it was not it's not really practical patients don't really want to pay out of pocket a whole lot, but it allowed them to get a revenue stream while they were applying for a new code. Ultimately, no, he did not get a new code. And his, he's moved to Los Angeles and now works in and started a new company, Lasso, which uh, focuses on products for athletes. So you can see that the 
older and disabled market turned out to not to be his focus. He changed his focus to athletics. It was more along the lines of his product. You follow what I'm saying? Okay. The second example is my favorite because I love Dean Kamen. And he invented this wheelchair and look at what it can do. It can climb stairs and you, the, the extra wheels would literally, uh, robotic wheels allowed somebody to ambulate up a flight of stairs or down. And it also extended so that the person could stand eye to eye. And the example that he used was to have people able to play golf. So hmm. what happened? What do you think happened with that $25,000 wheelchair? Nobody bought it. Lot, lots of people wanted it and wanted their insurance to pay for it. And a few people were able to afford it. But Medicare found that it was not reasonable or necessary for use in the patient's home. It's not reasonable to use taxpayer funds to spend $25,000 on something so someone can have the benefit of looking eye to eye in a wheelchair or playing golf. It's not a medical need to see eye to eye. And so ultimately we decided that it was not covered. And frankly, this was a product he took off out of, out of production because he couldn't find anyone to pay for it. Um, question? Uh-huh. Wouldn't it be considered a need to be able to walk up the stairs because let's yeah. say if there's like a fire or something like that, they could get out on their own? Well, one might think so, but the Americans with Disabilities Act has made it so every building has to have an accessibility and egress plan for anyone with a disability. And if you think about the need for a fire, that's not a medical need. Essentially, it's not a medical need. It's a safety concern, but they don't need it to treat their disease or illness. It's a mobility issue and a safety issue, but not a medical issue to treat. Remember what that de legal definition, it has to be reasonable and necessary for an injury or illness, and that's not primarily medical. That's a really important point as you're inventing things. You've got to be sure that, the, and like, I think Dean could have gotten this covered had he focused more on the medical need and maybe he could have gotten away with the psychological need because activities of daily living include good psychology. I think it was marketed wrong, may have had the same outcome, but I think they could have had better regulatory strategies. And this one is ongoing and I'm watching it every year. In 2014, Google contracted with Novartis to develop a glucometer in a contact lens. I thought this was so cool. And then Google filed their patent in 2015. And what they did was miss the basic science. Tears do not give you uh, good or reliable glucose measures. You And even today, you only get those uh, with blood, not even the, uh, the, the embedded uh, glucometers aren't get it, the measurement from interstitial tissue, and they're not reliable. And that's why they're not covered under Medicare. So that's what happened in 2018. But it has spawned this little cottage industry, including Apple getting into the business to try and do all sorts of measurements with contact lenses. And they were looking at things other than glucose. They're looking at blood pressure for people who need to monitor that, any biometric reading, temperature, anything where uh, you might want an automatic reading. And so those are the three examples. This one is still evolving and I suspect in another couple of years it will take a different path. But those are the three examples that I wanted uh, to explore with you today. And I'll ask if you have any questions about those. Okay, then I'll close with, you can see from these three examples, there are hundreds of thousands of successes. These three have not been successful yet. Each had a unique pitfall. Coding, coverage of reasonable and necessary, and this one was just didn't meet, hasn't yet met the medical criteria to be covered by the FDA yet. So each one has a little pitfall, and I will return to this slide where I told you, you really need experts to guide you through this 
this really specialized world. Uh, I you wouldn't want me doing a biomedical in, 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 invention, you, but uh, but you would want an expert to guide you through FDA and through insurance coverage. And with that, I will I will let you take back over. And uh, unless there are any questions, Bruce, can I ask you one question? of course. So backing up to the question of reimbursement. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. You had mentioned the 510K pathway. Uh -huh. I, I think of following a precursor or a predicate device to market. And so I'm wondering if, if that pathway is different than a completely novel device in terms of reimbursement. So, for instance, if you're, you're going down the 510K pathway, and if I'm right about it being sort of following some other device that's already demonstrated in that pathway, mm -hmm. does that make it easier for you to attach that? It does. Or, or reimbursement. Absolutely, it, it does. It may not be specific to what you really deserve in reimbursement, I suppose. It doesn't help so much with reimbursement, but it does help with FDA. You want a predicate device to to smooth the grease the skids. Is that the term? Grease the skids with FDA. And essentially, what you're saying with a predicate device is you've been down this road before FDA. The only difference is between what you've already approved and our device is this, and here is the relevant testing. But it doesn't necessarily make it easier to get to the next reimbursement, no. even though you're a predicate device. And in fact, many times I've had inventors call me and say, I've got a 510K, I'm ready to be paid. No, you've only gone with one part of the process it has no bearing on reimbursement whatsoever. None. Mm -mm. Now, where the predicate comes in with maybe it's not the same concept, but it would be like the crutches. We do have a predicate for covering crutches, so Una's uh, crutches would be covered, but he wanted not only coverage, but more, more reimbursement. All right, well, thank you so much for that great overview and those mm -hmm. three great examples. Um, now we're going to turn it over to Dr. David Kim for his, um, his examples. Getting your slides up. I don't know. I don't know if you have slides. Oh, no slides. Okay. Oh, we can't. You're muted. You have to unmute yourself. No. <laughs> Should be a, a little microphone button at the top of the blue jean screen. Not yet. Should we move over to Rosemary next and we'll come back to David? He was speaking earlier and he muted himself. So there, there should be a little um, microphone icon at the top of the blue jean screen to unmute audio. Probably have to hover at the top. Yeah. There. Oh, oh. <laughs> that's a video, but we're still seeing him. Yeah, that's strange. Maybe his computer is muted. Since we're dealing with the microphone. Okay, well, let, let's move. If it's okay with you, we'll move to Rosemary. Um, and maybe, David, if you could do a little bit more troubleshooting. We'll let you know if we can hear you, if you do want to test it out in the middle. I think that's okay. Oh. Rosemary, are you ready? I am. Wonderful. Can you hear me? We can. And we're going to okay. pull up your slides. So do, so, do you want to um, unmute your video so we can see you? I'm trying. <laughs> so unmute. I, I'm unmuted but i can't get the video on okay that's all right okay. we'll just bring up your slides it's uh, it's not working at the top it just says unmute video and then it has disable video um okay those are my uh, only options hello 
Oh, yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, uh, just to let you know, um, I have a thing that says moderator muted your video. And also, I was on multiple, I've been listening to the whole thing. Um, I, I think that I got muted in multiple different ways. So just, just to let you know. Okay. Sorry about that. So we'll, so do you want to go ahead with Dr. Tim? What's your preference, Stephen? You don't care. Um, no, yeah. I'm, okay. I, if you could hear me, okay. I, I can. Yeah, go ahead. Do you want me to do it? Go or ahead. should I go after Rosemary? Oh, okay. So I, uh, you know, actually I learned a ton from Teresa. Thank you. That was actually a great uh, basic overview. Um, also, I, I don't have slides. More than anything, I, I wanted to at least lay down some of the, the I would say, the, the view that I have as a, not only a clinician, but more as an investor. And uh, the things that I actually see uh, from entrepreneurs, and I have the privilege of also working with uh, other institutions such as UCSF and University of Michigan, where I see early technologies and ideas coming from academia being translated to, uh, you know, taking the next step towards uh, becoming a startup or uh, being licensed to uh, other institutions. Um, so, uh, you know, I'd uh, love to give you that background. So, in no way am I uh, an expert in reimbursement, but uh, what I see is that uh, I have now, um, as part of my uh, investments, we have 11 companies in my portfolio, and every single one of them is going through the process of trying to generate revenues. And reimbursement is one of the paths that you go through in order to get to the ultimate step of generating revenues for the company, which is basically at the end of the day, um, help, helps you define whether you're going to have a successful company or not. And so uh, for certain types of, uh, you know, um, either services or products, um, reimbursement is critical to the success. Um, for others, it may not. And I think that is important to as you are going through your initial technology assessments and you know um, project building and then ultimately company building, you, should, you define what is the pathway to generating revenues and to see if you know having reimbursement is actually an important thing. Um, the other thing that I would mention is that, and this is again coming from what Teresa uh, defined, is to separate out. Um, the user from the, your customer. Um, it really, you need to know, you know who's actually using the product and also who's actually paying for the product. And often it's not the same. And then a little nuance there is also to see if ultimate user uh, may be influenced by uh, you know, a champion along the way. Often it is the thing where you have to market to a provider who, ultimately use this on somebody, a patient, and you have to have that all, even though the actual pair of the product may be completely different. And depending on, you know, for sure, um, this is a major issue in an area that I invest in, which is called digital health. But um, it can also be an, uh, something of an impact uh, in uh, medical devices as well. Um, what I would say is that uh, the takeaway, again, is that um, as you go through this process of developing your idea all the way to execution, it is to define that, you know, um, uh, the revenues, uh, and you have to be flexible with the revenue uh, in a thought process. Um, it may be that uh, reimbursement is important, but you, there may be other tasks such as everything from direct to consumer to going directly to the actual payers or, you know, risk taking, um, you know, uh, self-insured employers and having them pay you directly for your device or your service. So, and in many ways that even may bypass the, uh, you know, the whole reimbursement process. Um, the, the last part that I actually want to share, and I'm, I'm not going to uh, delve into this and leave some um, time for questions, is that um, recently there has been this huge increase in, um, I would say interest about remote patient monitoring. Um, this is where, uh, you know, and Teresa, you're probably uh, maybe getting a lot more of this, is the, the ability for providers to get paid for offering services uh, more like a remote care. And it's been historically concentrated more on the cardiovascular, but now um, the, uh, the word on the street is that CMS wants to explore if it goes beyond the classic you know, measuring for blood pressure 
and even actually you know, extending towards you know, measuring glucose um, uh, as uh, more of an outpatient. Um, and these are some of, uh, some of the codes that have recently been really pressed forward. And you probably know this. This is the, uh, the, uh, the 99453, the 99454, those codes that are, have recently been um, offered out. And, and people are using this more aggressively to try to see if they could actually get uh, providers paid. Because what it does is when you have a mechanism in which the providers are getting paid to use certain type of technologies, it allows you to market um, more efficiently through this channel and then potentially have the providers on your side as you're trying to commercialize your product, ultimately to the, you know, the payers who in this case are the insurance companies. But it is this whole process where you gotta make sure that you have the buy-in from the providers in this case through having um, the CPT codes and then um, the insurance companies be more comfortable by providing that and ultimately the benefit goes to the, you know, the patients, but also this is a mechanism that you optimize the commercialization for the companies that are being, you know, uh, built in order to, you know, provide these services and technologies. And um, one last thing that I would just say that th there are now a number of um, therapies and actually, uh, you know, products that are out there um, that are going direct to consumer. And largely this is because um, the trend has been that there's greater amount of, you know, uh, patients needing to pay out of pocket for many of the, the products and technologies that they're needed even on a daily basis, whether it's through the insurance companies requiring higher, uh, you know, deductibles or just well, offering less of the, you know, the features of an insurance, but the, the patients are taking greater burden of paying for some of these things. And there's now technologies and again, and services where it's almost easier for the patients to go directly to buying those uh, out of pocket than actually go through the process of trying to get uh, insurance to pay for it. So I would just try to put that in mind. And um, these are examples of actually companies that I've invested in and that are really trying to um, experiment with some of these pathways in, in order to actually uh, generate revenues. And let me just leave it there and you know, open up for questions. Yes, please. Dr. Kim, you mentioned two five-digit numeric codes. And I'll just remind everybody, those are the level one established by the American Medical Association. Those were HICPICS codes for a doctor's services. And they are, I spent an hour of my time during this month reviewing remote patient data. And for that, Medicare pays $60 to the doctor. So that can be distributed over a month's time. And it's like a capitation fee for watching patients' electronic data. But that is an important way to market uh, a remote patient monitoring of biometric data. Right. And the, it's interesting that now I have about three of my portfolio companies that are really interested in using that pathway to really um, commercialize their product. One is um, a company called WellDoc, which uh, they've been around for over 10 years. They got their FDA clearance uh, about 10 years ago, and they're using this as a basis to provide a diabetes care to the individuals. But again, when you go to a you know, provider, they're more apt to use your type of technologies because it checks the box for them to actually get paid extra. And it's not like the physicians have to do all the work. In fact, they bring it down to the, often the lowest licensed folks who are capable of delivering that type of service. But they have to supervise it, but they have other people actually doing the work so that it actually allows them to kind of scale their own you know, business in a way. Um, and we have another company that, uh, you know, is, going to do this to check for measurements of, you know, of potential arrhythmias, uh, but done in a more remote way. And then I think the big one that people are really interested in is what are the biometrics that you need to uh, cover for like congestive heart failure, whether it is just, you know, blood pressure or daily weight, but there may be other types of biometrics that you can create that actually gives you a better understanding of how patients are doing, um, you know, out, outside of the clinic in a more chronic basis and for which the providers could get paid extra for something like this. 
Thank you. That you have such a unique experience, and I really want to thank you for sharing that with us. I think I'd like to ask um, uh, to hold questions for right now, and let's move to our third speaker, and then we'll loop back around and ask questions in the last five minutes or so. Um, so, Rosemary, um, are you ready to go? I am. I think I just. Oh, there you are. Love. We see yes, you. We see yes. You. Yay. I think I just we couldn't also... start it when somebody else was speaking or I was locked in. Okay. But okay. anyway, do um, you want me to get started or? Okay. Yes. yes. So part of what I'd like to talk about today is the value of demonstrating cost effectiveness in a clinical study. Um, and quite by accident, I found out about this when I had professed to a medical director that the particular technology or lab tests that I was trying to get coverage for was cost effective. His comment to me was, prove it in a clinical study. So there's a lesson learned that you don't ever indicate something that you can't prove. So be careful of that and learn the lesson from them. So what is cost savings and cost effectiveness? Um, actually, it's part of what they call health technology assessment, HTA. And I borrowed a line from ICEPOR, which um, captured this beautifully. But just to let you know, it, and not to read from the slide, but it is a component of evidence-based multidisciplinary process intended to support healthcare decision making by assessing properties and effects of one or more of the standard existing health technologies in comparison with the current standard, including cost of treatment. I now, I elaborated on this for, just for a, a little bit. Rosemary, um, we, we actually can't see your slides. Yeah, your slides oh, aren't, uh, aren't oh, sharing right be. now. All right, hang on. You know, this is just not my skill set. I'm here to tell you. Oh, golly. How do I That's get okay. that? I, I know you were trying to share them earlier, but I had to cancel them off because we had other presentations running. All righty. Uh, I got it. Let me see. End show. Let me end the show and try this again. Okay, why is it doing this? So just go to the blue jeans screen and uh, do the share. I did. Uh, Let me do it again. Yep. Okay. Now it's not even letting me get there. Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay. It says I'm sharing. Yep. We can see your screen. Just restart your presentation and we should be good to go. Can you see it now? We see the blue jeans screen. You are sharing oh blue God. jeans. Uh. <laughs> this is a hoot. Well, yeah. your, your commentary has been very good. If you'd like to just continue with other slides, <laughs> your choice. <laughs> this is driving me bananas, though. It's like I'm bound and determined. It says I'm sharing it, but. You're sharing your blue jeans and not the PowerPoint. Okay, well, it says share screen. Right, and then it should give you some options. It does, micro, oh, it now it gives me an option. There oh, we go. Oh, oh. We see it. <laughs> Hot dog, I told you I was determined. It didn't give me that option earlier, but maybe I was going too quickly. Okay, so let me apologize. So there you go, there's the first slide, which I just kind of went into deep dive on. Um, but basically, it's also comparing it to current technology that's similar to yours. Um, and that's really, really important. So if you've got a similar device to your, to someone else or to another company, if yours is three times the amount, that definitely is not cost effective um, and can hold, hold you still in terms of trying to get coverage or enough reimbursement if there's already a HICS-PICS code assigned to it. So it is, as I mentioned just now, it is so critical to approval from the health plan regarding your technology. So one of the things that a medical director at a health plan is tasked with is making sure that whatever technology has been approved and there's a positive medical policy that it is, it is um, 
good for the beneficiaries. It has to be cost effective because you know they're watching their pennies so they can put more money in the stock market. And then on the other hand, you know, you can't have the costs so far outweigh other technology that it's just cost inhibited. So, you know, a couple things to know. Is your product new to market? If it is, um, you know the path you have to take in terms of uh, PMA. Um, is there a comparative? which you want to do, you want to look at your competitors and see what their charges are or their cost. And more importantly, is there an existing medical policy pertaining to that technology? If so, is it negative or positive? Um, and as a consultant, this is one of the things I'll do for startup companies is try to compare it to something that is already in the market and take a look at those medical policies. And although they may not be specific to that new technology, it certainly gives you an idea. However, with that being said, I've also seen companies not covered or be excluded in a medical policy even though their technology was similar to that that existed. Uh, there was something about the technology or there weren't enough clinical studies or, you know, there was some history to it that you may or may not be aware of. Um, and as a side note on a medical policy, one of the, it's kind of like reading a roadmap. There's hints and clues all the way through it. And when you get to the very bottom of it, it'll actually cite all the clinical studies and medical technology assessment companies that they utilize to help determine what that medical policy is gonna be. So for instance, if your product device just came out with a new clinical study that's been published, you may wanna tap the shoulder of the medical director and say, hey, you didn't look at all of them, here's another one I'd like you to take a gander at. Um, and that's a conversation for a whole different time, but there is a way to do that. So as I mentioned, there's other technology assessment organizations or companies, and those are very much considered um, in terms of looking at medical policy. So who are some of those companies? Well, Hayes Technology is one, and uh, one that's widely used. ACRI CMS, as we know, ISPOR, and who knows who, who the official disability guidelines are or what it's used for? Come on, take a gander. Not commercial insurance, not Medicare. What's another one? Disability insurance. There you go. It's actually for workers' compensation. So particularly if you have an orthopedic device or spine device, something that um, is, is widely used for uh, injuries, that is something you need to pay attention to. Because if you've got a negative medical policy, and there's only two that are national, um, ODG is one of them, ACOM is the other one. Um, 38 states actually use ODG, um, and some states actually have their own home, what I call homegrown <laughs> guidelines, and then the balance of them may use a combination of ACOM and ODG. But that's really, really important. And based on some findings that I found, uh, at least 35 to 40% of the business um, with orthopedic or spine devices is actually contributed to the workers' comp population. So something to keep in mind. And by the way, if you're not the one billing the payers, then you kind of have to rely on the clientele that you're selling to. So if you're selling to a hospital and they stop buying it because 40, 50% of their surgeries are related to workers' comp injuries, then, then you need to jump on that bandwagon and get that fixed. So I love, love, love folks who can develop new technology. You're brainiacs, you're so much smarter than I am. But at the end of the day, you know, the theory is if you build it, they will come is not accurate because it's not a baseball field, right? It's cool technology, it's, it's getting a need, but it's always being developed. And, you know, you're, you're trying to beat out the competition, but it doesn't mean that it's going to take the place of the com competition. You've got to look at the cost comparatives, the cost effectiveness. You know, can it completely replace other technology? 
And is it all inclusive or is it just a piece of the treatment? So in the technology, you want to see how many other steps or treatment modalities that you can avoid or that the patient can avoid um, by maybe using your technology. And that's very much something you want to keep in mind. So as I mentioned earlier, you got to prove it. Don't say it's cost effective if you can't demonstrate that it's cost effective. And again, you may want to keep in mind to keep those endpoints in any clinical trials or studies that you're going to do. And there's a lot of good information out there um, to demonstrate how that can be done and when you should actually start it. And part of it is maybe at the very beginning. Um, so that you've got a benchmark from which to measure. You know, what is the value of your technology? Has it improved the patient outcomes? Is there a long-term effect from it, or is it just a temporary fix? And please, please have more than one clinical study. Um, based on my experience, an average of three to five with your patient population definitely being larger than 500 is kind of a good place to start, but then again, it also depends on your technology and uh, what it's specified for. So if it's for a very minor population of patient or disability or uh, disease state, then that needs to be kept in mind and Okay. And then you definitely want to have a variance in patient population, multi-center trials across the U.S. You can have European trials done as well, as, but the one key thing to keep in mind from that is that it needs to be published in an English-speaking journal or a journal that where it's in English. You know, you want to get a wide variety of charges and then do an average of those uh, because treatment's going to cost different differently in, in different areas of the country, different areas of the world, of the globe, um, kind of depends, but you can come up with some averages from which you want to measure. Um, and be careful in choosing the methodology of cost determinations. Stick to one method and make sure that it's sound. Um, you want to utilize a valid source for these costs. You want to quote that source. And again, you want to keep an average of those costs um, that you're utilizing. So in essence, um, cost effectiveness is a critical point in health plan coverage. Um, again, you want to incorporate at least one clinical study, if not more. Um, coverage is critical to the success of your device, as you've heard through all of us. Um, you want to make sure that when you're measuring the outcome in the patient, that it's, it's done in more than one way. And please compare this to existing technology so that they have an idea of what that cost is going to be and what it costs the plan or the workers' comp plan or Medicare or any of the above. So I know I kind of rushed through this a little bit, but I'm trying to be conscientious of the time and give you all time to ask questions. And I believe, yep, I put my contact information on the back half here. Um, Simply, if you have any questions, I welcome you to reach out and ask me whatever you can, and I'm happy to answer it. Thank you Thanks so much. So really, <laughs> yes, thank you. We're really happy to have you. Um, so we technically have one minute left, but I'm going to ask if the panelists or the, the speakers could stay on for an additional five minutes, and if any of the attendees needs to has a hard stop at, at 2.15 and would like to leave or need to leave, we'll, of course, understand that. Um, Rosemary, David, Teresa, is that okay? An extra five minutes just to entertain questions? Absolutely. Um, thank you so much. Uh, David, are you still on? Yes, I see you, so that's a good sign. Um, okay. Yeah, I I'm on. Good, good. Uh, Wilbur, is there anyone on the Georgia Tech side that has a question? We haven't heard from you all, so I want to make, give you first chance. Any questions on our side? So I guess we'll, we'll, uh, one question for, for David, for, for Dr. Kim. From an investor standpoint, um, you know, all these important nuances that Rosemary and Teresa talked about, when um, you see a new company, how much of this needs to be lined up uh, and how much of a strategy needs to be in place for you to really get interested? Or is it really just a case-by-case -case basis? 
Um, what I would say is that um, we don't dive into this level of due diligence at the onset of evaluating a company, especially in the technologies that are just coming out of, a, let's say, an institution, academic institution. It is unlikely that we're going to, you know, dive into that. However, it doesn't mean that it's not important. Often it gives us a better sense that you actually understand the market and how something needs to be you know, um, you know, commercialize. Uh, if, if you tell me that, well, we're just going to get, get, go through reimbursement, like, okay, that doesn't really tell me if you're being thoughtful or not. Um, uh, definitely when I see a lot of the companies that I uh, invest in is in this, what's called series A stage, meaning that you have already gone through the technology assessment. You've probably gone through most of your clinical as well as um, either right at FDA approval or just got your FDA approval. By that time, you should have a really good idea of how you're going to get to your revenues. And it, it's a definition of, again, who are the users, but also who are the, the people who are actually going to write a check and what are the reasons. And if there is a reimbursement pathway that really is gonna help you to make sure that you get this commercialized, we wanna know that you understand that. And often this is where actually people like Rosemary and Teresa will be asked to get involved, um, you know, often uh, when, uh, you know, entrepreneurs and, you know, new CEOs, they're just trying to struggle through this, we would recommend go get professional help so that you really have to find this because ultimately for us, it's like every month that you're learning on the job is additional month that we have to invest in. And that's more risk that we're taking. So we want you to have done the homework early on and have really defined that pathway. Not to say that you've already done it, but you, at least the minimum, you understand what that is and what the hurdles are. Thank you. Um, I don't think we have any questions on the chat. Any questions at the Emory location? Okay. Um, so if, if I may just ask one question to sum everything up. Is it ever too early to think about reimbursement and and uh, payment strategies during a de device um, or any kind of innovation? Is there a too early, or is it, should it always be something that's in the back of your minds? Create. If, if I could just. Uh, oh, yeah. Go ahead. yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Teresa. Oh, um, well, what I would say is that you may want to do this work up front, just so that you understand what the hurdles are. If the hurdles are extremely high, then you may have to think about it. For example, if it's, uh, you know, you have a nice clear predicate that allows you to get through the 510K process, and then, you know, there's a good um, understanding that the coverage is uh, existing products are pretty good and the payments are pretty good, then that makes it a much more interesting opportunity to go after. If there is a process where you have to go de novo, you know, because there isn't a predicate through the FDA process, then you at least you understand what the hurdles are that it's going to be a lot more, let alone if you're going to go through a PMA process, which means it's a lot longer. And you better understand that, you know, is there a lot of pricing pressure in those pathways, you know, when you actually get like there are certain areas of medical devices, like, you know, there's a lot more pressure for payment for like orthopedics products now than there were 10 years ago. Is that an area of interest for potential investors to go in? Unless you have something really novel that could actually break through that, it may not be as interesting. And so these are some of the things that you should at least think about early on, not to say that you have all of the pathway mapped out, but at least think through what are the hurdles and the risks that you're taking. I've always Thanks. recommended 12 to 18 months before launch, uh, just so you have an idea. And it's, at that point too, it can also assist in pricing um, your device, if you know what those parameters are. Okay, that's now a good one, rule. Yeah, one thing to keep in mind, if I can, um, it, Teresa d stated this so eloquently, but Medicare is more than just um, just looked at for medical policy coding and coverage. It's also looked at for benchmarking reimbursement. So yeah. even though right. commercial Absolutely. plan, yeah, commercial plans don't necessarily utilize Medicare reimbursement rates, what they do is they'll bounce off of it. 
So unfortunately, you won't always know what that contracted or negotiated fee is with your customer. Um, and so usually what I've done historically is I've gone 80% below Medicare all the way up to 150%, just so you get an idea of what that range is and it helps you price your product. No, I think that's a really important point, Rosemary, is, is that um, it, it is, they're used as more of a benchmark. And not yeah. to say that commercial insurance companies are lazy, but it's always nice to have that benchmark for them to make their decisions. Right. When, I think we have a question from Satya. Satya. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'd like to first of all welcome my old friend, Teresa. Hi. I saw your name. I was a culprit who brought you here, I think. I introduced or mentioned about you so that you could add value to this. And really, it's fantastic listening to all that you have to say. But I want to narrate one simple uh, example to see how important this topic is. When I first, when the, one of the first projects we did in our MBID program was a urology project dealing with the poly, poly catheter, where hardly any innovation has been done in over 100 years. The students were having a tough time how to get a reimbursement code and the strategy. They're all scratching in the dark. That's when my inquiries led to Teresa as a contact and I brought her into the program. And what was troubling us for over six months, Teresa, within three minutes of talking to the team, she gave us a strategy and a move forward option, which worked like magic. So what I am saying to this example is, Teresa's comment that bring this early on into the front end of the product development. I know that as a scientist, at the front end, we are more concerned with good science, the technology, and we tend to ignore all other things. But in today's world, there's no option. We have to bring in health economics, outcomes analysis, reimbursement strategy, and eventually reimbursement monetization. These are the elements that at least at the bare minimum, we need to cover the ground and include these as team members from the very early stages of the project. My career in industry and in my current role have taught me that. So I just wanted to share that with you all. Thank you so much, Sathya. I think that's a great recap of all of the expertise that this session has brought and some real food for thought. Um, and with that, I would, um, I think I'll close this session and really thank our panelists once again, if you'll join me from wherever you are. <laughs> and, and please, um, we'll be distributing, uh, we'll be distributing, distributing a survey. Distributing a survey after this to everyone. If you'll please just give us your quick comments, it'll just take a minute or less, and let us know what you'd like to hear about um, in the next Glue session. So thanks again to everyone. Really appreciate your time and attention. Was there a Thank slide that you, you wanted to buy? If you go oh, you do want to bring it up? Okay. No, 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 that's okay. Okay. It, it, you know how the, at the end they were talking about pricing? I skipped it just to conserve time, but I've given you two URLs to look up Medicare pricing because that really is the driver in the market. And so once you have your code, I've given you two quick rule of thumb links in there. Okay. When you get the slides, you can use it. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, really appreciate you coming. And, um, oh, my goodness. Satya was right.